Hello, and welcome to our video audio podcast, Couched in Color. I'm your mental health expert, teen and young adult crusader, and psychological scientist, Dr. Alfie. This podcast reflects my life's work, helping our young people and young at heart identify mental health challenges, disrupt negative patterns, and discover the best versions of themselves. I'm so happy that you've joined us. For over 20 years, I want you to know that I've had my finger on the pulse of BIPOC teen mental health. I recognize that historically and currently with these dual pandemics of COVID and racial injustice raging, our young people are suffering, sometimes they're struggling, and always the care that they need is quite scarce. So each week I'm joined by young people, mental health experts, celebrities, and influencers to help us uncover the secrets to healing the hearts and minds of our BIPOC teens, their families, and their communities. Here at Couched in Color, we believe deeply in spreading love and light bolstered by culturally relevant science. So let's dive in. So welcome everyone to Couched in Color. You have no idea how excited I am for my guest. I don't get nervous, but there's been two guests I've had. This is one of them where I was actually nervous to talk to them. I don't know what that's about. So I got to like do my deep breathing and like get my mind right while she's talking. And so my guest today is Ryan Pete. Um, and Ryan, if you would please introduce yourself, many of my listeners and watchers, because we're audio and video, will know who you are. But would you just introduce yourself and then on the tail end of that, tell us a little bit about what your interest and passion is around this issue of mental health in young people. Uh, my name is Ryan Pete. Um, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I'm currently in New York right now, but I'm moving back to LA um, in a few weeks. So um, soon I will be in New York. But um, I do a bunch of different things. Um, I'm an author. I um, have written two books with my mom about my experience having a brother with autism. One of them is a children's book. Oh, I have a smoke. My smoke one. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, I have written two books with my mom, Holly Robinson Pete, um, about my experience having a twin brother with autism. One of them, um, the first book we wrote, my brother Charlie, um, it's a children's book and it won an NAACP award in 2011. Um, and then we wrote a, another book Saint, called Same But Different that um, was released, I think 2018, I wanna say. Um, and, um, and it's more of like a chapter reading young adult yeah. book, um, yeah. both having to do with just like my personal experience with having a mother with autism and so, um, I've spent a lot of my life advocating for my brother and, um, helping those, um, that ha like helping families with autism that don't necessarily have access to, um, the resources to help their, um, kids and stuff. And so, um, it's one thing I do. I'm also a singer songwriter. I, um, just graduated in May from NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. Um, I, I don't have any music out right now, but I plan okay. on releasing. I've been working on an, a music project, an EP that I plan on releasing um, sometime. It's like spring 2021. So <laughs> look out for that. Um, but in the meantime, if you want to look up some like snippets and stuff of me singing, you can go to my Instagram. Um, it's at Ryan E. Pete. Um, there's also a link to a recent live set that I did in my bio as well. So if you do you want to check out some music stuff that I have done, you can totally um check that out um those are mainly like the two worlds that i kind of live in i am an author and like do a lot of help within like the autism community mm -hmm. but then also i am an artist and singer songwriter myself and um i'm currently just you know piecing together stuff i shot a music video recently that i am ah! on putting out some time in the spring as well um just you know using this pandemic period because i have so much time on my hands because we're all just kind of like at home you know and yeah. just really um piecing together a really like nice musical project so um that's, that's what i've been up to but um the topic of mental health is um very important to me and the timing of you i'm um, asking me to be a part of this is so funny because um i recently um at least not recently i guess for like the past four months or so mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. Um, was prescribed antidepressants for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. I um, have been taking Lexapro for mm -hmm. like four months now okay. um, to help manage my anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting because I definitely feel like with Black people, uh, mm -hmm. mental health issues get swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was 13. 
Okay. And um, when I was diagnosed with ADHD, and now looking in hindsight, I definitely feel like I was misdiagnosed. Mm. Um, but um, when I was first diagnosed with ADHD um, in 2013, I was prescribed Adderall, Concerta, like mm-hmm. all the different types of medication. And mm-hmm. I had the worst reaction to it. It mm. just did not work with my system. It was not, it was just, it made me feel like a zombie. I was underweight. It was like really messing with my mental health. It was just not a good thing. And so then um, I completely stopped taking medication for a really long time and had a lot of like hesitations about going back on medication. But I also knew that like while I was in school, um, my anxiety levels and my depression levels got so high to the point where it was like not manageable at all. And I Mm -hmm. tried everything. Like I was working out excessively three days a week. I had like a personal trainer. We were like strength training. Mm -hmm. Um, I was journaling. Like I tried like every, like hypnotherapy, acupuncture, Mm -hmm. um, you name it. I've tried everything to try and help manage these issues Mm -hmm. um, and nothing was working in it finally took me being in the pandemic and just really not being able to get a grip on my mental health Mm -hmm. for me to then go try out Lexapro. And it has completely changed my life. And it's crazy because I feel like if, um, I don't know, it's a shame because I feel like, like I said earlier, like a lot of um, people of color get Mm -hmm. um, swept under the rug in terms of mental Mm -hmm. health issues and stuff. And Mm -hmm. I definitely feel like I was also one of those people that was definitely like swept under the rug. Like they just Mm kind of threw me and just like, okay, you have this disorder, like whatever, Mm -hmm. like we're just going to like throw medication at you and see what happens. And it completely just wrecked me in high school. So, um, but yeah, I've just been doing a lot of like self-reflection and I, now that I've been on Lexapro for like four months, it's been yeah. like, wow, like I like if I had known to have taken Lexapro like two, three years ago, I mm-hmm. can't imagine like the different type of like trajectory I would have had while in school. And um, just thinking about how much my anxiety wouldn't have crippled me in so many instances. Um, that was a yeah. Long answer, no, sweetheart, you're fine. You're fine. And I appreciate you being so open because you touched on so many things that I think are so important. And, and honestly, it probably sounds cliche, but that's exactly why I started the podcast because I think there's so many of us who are black and people of color who've had experiences similar to yours. Either one, you know, their perspective is I am never taking any of those medications. It makes me think about like right now with the vaccine, right? About to come mm-hmm. out. And when you look at the data, the group that is the least likely to say they're going to take it is black people. And I'm yeah. like, and you sort of, and then people are critical of black people. I'm like, eh, why, you know, what's wrong with them? But then you have to think like historically, what have black people's experiences been? It's so true. In the, right? In these settings. In the so like health, like world and stuff, it's scary. Yes. They don't care about us. <laughs> no, no. And you get just thinking about what you said when you were a child, right? And you've, you've been very open about, you know, you come from a famous family. And so your family has access to resources, but even for you, right? Going in, there's a misdiagnosis, right? Like you said, you, it probably wasn't ADD. And then yeah. there was, right, right? And so it's like, if you, with all the access to resources that you have, you know, you're getting the best care. But what is upsetting to me is that even theoretically what's the best care often is not the best care for us as black people because I don't think people right they don't know what to look for in us they don't know how to diagnose often not always because there are many mental health professionals out there who do know how to diagnose but there's so many more they don't know what this stuff looks like in black young people and so you end up with like a situation like yours and then when people say well here take these meds you're kind of like I've been working with you for all this time and I still feel like crap. I'm not taking no meds. Crazy because like when I was in high school, I was, I remember distinctly taking Adderall and it was like a mess. Like I was severely underweight. I was having really dark, dark thoughts. Um, It was just not a good period for me. And I would tell my psychiatrist all of these things. Like I can still like, I'm getting, doing well in school, but I feel, my brain feels miserable. And her response was to just up my dosage. (laughs) 
Oh my God. And it didn't but make you, it feel worse. And then I just stopped going to her out. And yeah. And that and that's what happens. That's what happens. People stop. You vote with your feet, right? Like you like I have so many young people who will tell me, thank God I've and it's not just black young people. They're like, thank God we found you. Parents are like in tears. They're like, oh my God, thank you so much for you like being a black woman who does this because we were about to pull our hair out. Cause I went to this one and this one and this one. They don't listen. They're not taking me seriously. And you're listening. And you know that's sad, Ryan. It's sad that people are happy that I listen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're thankful for people like you that actually, you know, like advocate for us because, you know, we need more people like you out there. <laughs> yes. You know what's funny? Um, when my brother was, when my brother RJ was first diagnosed with autism, we mm-hmm. were both, di- we both were tested at the same time. Okay. Okay. And the doctor said that we both had autism when my brother was first diagnosed. They thought I also had autism too. And then I, they did I'm speechless. Test. And then they did another test later and then found out I didn't have autism. But my parents were confused because like they were like, oh, well, RJ is the person that like we were going in to get tested. But Ryan, like we don't really see the same things in Ryan. Like, are you sure that she right. has autism? Right. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's that as well. Like literally it's, it's crazy. I mean, this, it was is. Back, this was back in 2000 where there wasn't as much information about autism. Right. There, but still like, right. Right. But still, right. And I can see just from interacting with you, not that you can always tell right off the bat, but there's sort of markers that you look for. Like I have a guest who's a neuropsychologist out in LA and her primary focus is developmental disorders and she's expert in autism. And she talks, you know, she's like, she knows it like the back of her hand and she's white, but she gets how often people of color and black people in particular are misdiagnosed, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they're diagnosed properly, they don't get the right supports. And she said, she's always talking to black parents about how to, where this is where you go to get the right kind of supports that are like culturally relevant for you. So you saying to me, you know, that they diagnosed both of you with it. And like, I, as a parent, I would be confused too, because I would be like, wait a minute, no, I'm not seeing the same things in both of my children. And I just want to make sure that my kids are getting exactly what they're supposed to have so like what are you talking about yeah. and then having to like sort of walk through that process so it's not I don't need like that I can't imagine how challenging that must have been for your parents or for you and your brother it's crazy yeah insane insane <laughs> yeah so I just really appreciate again that you're really open about taking medication and acknowledging, you know, what some of the struggles are. I, for full disclosure, I'm anxious as well. And it runs in my family. And so I try to be real open with people. I say it all the time about how I manage my own anxiety. And I have relatives who, you know, we've had lots and lots of talks, but it was through us talking and, you know, and me being a mental health professional and saying, look, please go try the meds. Just let's find you a good doctor or nurse practitioner and let's just see how they work. And for the one that I'm thinking of, it, like you said, it changed her life. So what was it for you that made you decide, okay, I'm going to go ahead and try meds. I'm just, I'm going to try this. Um, I would say like from my junior year of college on, I just really struggled with my anxiety. Just like I was just in a really bad space mentally and just, it was just not a good period for me. And I just reached a point where my anxiety levels were so unmanageable to the point where I just could not function. And I mm-hmm. thought I could, I would try to like convince myself that like, mm-hmm. oh, I can do this. I'm mm-hmm. fine. I don't need medication, like mm-hmm. whatever. And um, then just came to like, really just looked at myself in the mirror when I was home in LA, um, like when I first flew home for school and I was just mm-hmm. like, no, like you're in my anxiety to the point where it's like messing up my personal relationships, like getting in the way of my friendships. It's just mm-hmm. it's overall just getting in the way of me just thoroughly enjoying my life and so I was mm-hmm. like okay whatever I'm just gonna try this and you know it was like baby steps like I was just like okay I'm just gonna try five milligrams mm-hmm. um, I try it for a few like weeks if I don't like it I just mm-hmm. I stop taking it it's I'm not it's not super scary like I had to really psych myself out and be like mm-hmm. okay this is different from my experience with Adderall and Concerta this is a whole different medication mm-hmm. and I just have like like I said, like I've been the, ha- I mean, other than, you know, pandemic related stuff. Right, like, right. Like I just looked up online the amount of coronavirus cases that are in New York and it's spiked to 10,000 a day. So <sighs> it's terrifying. Ah, um, right. But 
Um, but other than, you know, pandemic related stuff, I am the happiest I've been like mentally in like two years, <sighs> only like literally solely due to my Lexapro. Like I'm so thankful for my medication. Oh, that's so, so yeah. I'm just like, so happy to know that it's helping you, right? Like if yeah. people need to hear that it can help, but you've got to get the right medication. You've got to get the right dose and you've got to have the right diagnosis because you got to know, you know what yeah. I mean? You got to be taking the medication for the right thing. So for you, was it something where you said, okay, this is the medication I need. And then you went and found somebody or did, was it suggested to you? Let's try this med. Cause I want young people to hear sort of how this process works well, when it works well. For me, it was actually like my mom had been pressuring me to try and like go on medication forever because as a mom, she saw how much my anxiety yes. levels were just like yes. such a mess. And so she was just like, Ryan, you need to go on medication. You need like medication will help you like try it, try it. But I mm. was still ha like kind of reeling from my like yeah. anxieties from when I took like Adderall and Concerta in high school. So I was really hesitant about going Got back it. on medication. Got so it. I was very resistant at first. Like this was like for you, like while I was in school, my mom was just like, go on medication. It will help you. Yes. I was like, oh, my. like the side effects are going to be too scary. I'm yes. Too I don't want to do this. Um, but then I just like realized I was like, no, I need extra help. And so then um, through my therapist, my therapist connected me with the psychiatrist. And Good. Um, I did a Zoom call with her back in July. Okay. And talked about. Um, like the different stuff I went through the past two years and just like uh, my anxiety levels and stuff. And then we just agreed that Lexapro would be a good starting point. And then if, um, if anything changes or whatever, we just like switch to another drug or stop taking it all together. And then ever since I've just been taking Lexapro. And <sighs> so what I want everybody who's listening and watching to hear is that it takes a lot of support, right? You had a mom who was like, just try it, right? And you, your mom loves yeah. you and you know your mom is not going to tell you something that she didn't think would be good for you, right? But she just was sort of persistent. Even though you had hesitations, there's probably something in the back of your mind was like, okay, well, mom said try it, mom said try it. And then you got to a point where you were ready. And so the second source of support was your therapist. And your therapist was able to connect you with someone that you could, you know, a psychiatrist, a physician who could a prescribe woman, it. actually. A black oh, psychiatrist. Oh, I, I, I didn't know she was black until we Zoomed and I was like, thank God. Right? <laughs> support. I um, love it. So. Yeah. And so having somebody like visibly, you can like, okay, right. That sort of, I know for me, it brings the stress level down. Right. Cause when I've talked to people, actually one, I had one who was amazing. She was Latina, but she grew up on the South side of Chicago and she grew up around in a black, predominantly black environment. Mm -hmm. And just talking to her, it was like, she got stuff I didn't have to explain stuff. And I feel like that's so important. It's like when you see that person, there's a little bit of you that feels like, oh, they kind of look like me. So yeah. maybe they'll understand. And that is the entree. And so I just, I hope that people are hearing that it wasn't just, oh yeah, let's just go try it. Because for some of us, especially black folks, it's not that easy. So I just really yeah. appreciate you sharing that process and journey with us. Yeah, it's funny because like my, while my mom was really pressuring me, not like, yeah, pre I wouldn't even yeah. say pressuring, but like in the best, like with the best intentions. That's please, right. Please, like take That's medication, right. it'll help. Um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, who I was also quote, close with at the time, yeah. um, was like, is very not, a, like not with medication. She's like, I don't like this. Like she was on it. Like when I stopped taking Adderall and Concerta in high school, she was like, rooting for me she's like yeah i'm so happy for you <laughs> right like, stop taking those drugs you can like get yourself back again <laughs> right um and even when i was like starting to like look into like taking medication and stuff she was like i don't know about that you can just solve your own problems it's fine but also like she wasn't like physically there with me and she didn't physically see like how much i was really just struggling overall so i was like okay whatever i'm just gonna like start taking medication. And yeah. Yeah. But you know what, what you're speaking to is those generational differences because yeah. your mom and I are probably about the same age and then, which means our parents are probably close to the same age. And so for that generation, like, you know, I think because I'd like kind of beat my dad over the head with it for so long, we lived together. So, you know, I was like just down there talking to him. If I were to say to him now something about, oh, I think I might need to go take medication or I have kids who are a little bit younger than you, mm -hmm. I, you know, let's put the kids on a med today he might be like mm, I don't know but okay if that's what you think is best but like 10 years ago 
Absolutely not. Them kids yeah. don't need no meds and black people, we can solve our own problems. You know what I mean? Like, it's just this. So I really appreciate, you know, the way that we met through Lexi Underwood and her show that she put together. So many young people, like, there's like 20 of us on that call. Yeah, it was a lot. It was, it was, but I loved it. It just, no, it you all have no idea. It was amazing. Just watching you, I was like, oh my God, I want to be like 16 again. Cause I need like, I need these kids in my life. So what do you think is different about your generation that makes you much more, much more open to these things, especially talking about mental health than like me and your mom's generation, Gen X and older generations. Do you think there's anything different about you all? Um, I would say, um, I think as, you know, um, time has gone on, I think there's definitely been like more, I guess, like representation in terms of people opening up about their mental health stuff. Like I know there's a lot, I, I can't think of any on the top of my head, but I know that there's been like, definitely like a bunch of public figures that have opened up about their mental health or like taken social media breaks and they've been like, oh, my mental health is too much. Like yep. mental health is just a topic that's, I guess, talked about more so now. And I think just with social media, as well is definitely yeah. helped with that too. Yeah. And so um, I definitely think that social media is probably like the biggest influential factor in people being more open about um, talking about mental health things and being more open about it and stuff. I so. think so. Like the two that come to right to the top of my head when you were talking now, they're also my generation, but a lot of people don't know how old they are. So Taraji Henson and Charlamagne, the guy, they're like always talking about, you know, their yeah. mental health. And then I think about there's a young woman, I knew of her, but I think I started following her recently on social media. Her name is Sarah Jeffries and she's on Charmed and she will talk about, she's pretty open, you know, like she seems open to the idea of discussing mental health and she's a very young person. So mm -hmm. I see so many young people, like I remember they had an episode of um, Grownish where they were like, so it was like front and center. They were talking about mental health and I was like, that is, yeah, I guess just, I was just like beaming because I was like, this is so important. But it's just like you said, that social media has kind of given everybody a platform because you have like, like mental health influencers, like you have these mental health professionals, like there's this woman, this British woman, Dr. Julie Brown, I think it is, she got like over 100,000 followers. I'm like, how'd she do that? Like, and she's a psychologist. And so yeah. I think you're right. It's just social media has really given people space. And like you said, the representation is what's so important. And even what you're doing right now just really helps a lot of young people. They can see somebody who's beautiful, who's talented. I do want to talk about your music in a second. You know what I mean? Like who's already been an author and they can see themselves in you. And I have to mention something that we have in common. I also went to NYU. So we're fellow oh, really? violets. Yeah, what I did. did you go to at NYU? I was at um, the School of Education. It used to be called, it had this long, crazy name called SINHAP, S-E-N-H-A-P, but now it's just the School of Education. So yeah. Oh my gosh, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was like I got a master's there. It was two of the best years of my life. Just being in that area, this was obviously pre-COVID, like yeah. a million years ago. Like, and so when you started, I'm sure it was pre-COVID. But the energy and like just yeah, it's God, a very it was awesome. unique, it's a very unique college experience. And I feel really lucky that I got to experience like most like mainly my like last semester of college got cut short due to the pandemic, but I still right. had three and a half years of like real NYU college experience. So I yes. feel really lucky that I, um, that I had that. Um, I can't, I can't imagine going to school right now in the middle of a pandemic. Like my heart goes out to college students right now going through that. Because, yeah. It's too much. They have, you have no social, much. right? Cause so much of college is the social piece and you yeah. can't, you can't do any, especially in a place like New York where the university is really the city. Do you know what I mean? Like really? there's sort of not a campus. I never really felt like NYU had a campus. You were just in the city, like Washington Square Park. Yeah. Like that's the university or going to Chinatown to eat. Like I just have so many wonderful memories. Of, yeah. And there's always so much stuff to do. But yeah. now with the pandemic. It's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's really tricky. Um, yeah. But, oh my God, it's so fun. I didn't know you went to NYU. I did. I loved it. I really did. It was just two years, but I really loved it because that's when I was young and I was like, hmm, because I went to Howard for undergrad. And then I was like, hmm, I want to live in New York. Let me apply to NYU. Like that was yeah. literally my line of thinking, which was real dumb, but it was a great experience. I wouldn't yeah. trade it for anything. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. So tell me a little bit about how... Um, I'm really curious, and I think we can get into the artistic side of you. The first thing I want to ask about is how the book came about, 
right? So I know you were really young, but what made you decide? And I remember that book. I actually think we might have that book in our home. <laughs> but like, what, how did you all decide to do that? What was that process like? Well, when my brother was first diagnosed with autism, the only books that were available were just textbooks this thick and they were all <laughs> super scientific. And for somebody like me, who is mm-hmm. like, like four or five, like three, mm-hmm. four or five, like going through my childhood, mm-hmm. I would have loved to have had a children's book that um, described, like explained what autism is mm-hmm. in a way that was just not in such a complicated text. That's so techy. Mm-hmm. In a way where like a five-year-old would be able to understand. And right. so my mom and I came together and we were just like, let's make our own book <laughs> because they don't exist. And right. so, um, and so that's really what inspired us to um, make My Brother Charlie because there just wasn't a children's book out there that sh- talked about these issues in a way where younger kids would be um, able to understand what autism yeah. is and from a way that wasn't judgmental either, like from a way that was more like normalized and not yep. like degrading or anything. So, yep. uh, so that's really how that came about. And then from there we um, built upon uh, making same but different, which was more of like a chapter book, like young adult novel, yeah. more geared towards people that are like 11, 12. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, it just kind of evolved, but that's mainly the main reason why we um, started to do. Or why I love it. I love it. And it also sounds like what it is able to do is tap into your creative side, right? Because your family, I'm assuming, right? Because I know your mom for many years and, and still is an actress, um, that that creative piece, having a book like that, that really can lay it out, like just visually even, right? With visuals and words for kids is really important. And which speaks to, you know, what you just said about where you graduated from your degree is from something that has to do with the arts. So tell me about how you use the arts, if at all, um, to really express yourself. Like, do you, when you sing through the music that you create, do you talk about things related to your mental health? Or is it just like more global? Like, this is my life and like mental health is one piece, but you know, I want to sing about all these other things. What's that, that artistic process like for you? Um, I do talk about like more mental health things um, as well. And my my music's pretty like diverse. Like I talk about a wide variety of things. I'll talk about like, I do talk a lot about like being anxious and sad. Um, Okay. Okay. I talk a lot about like heartbreak. I talk a lot about just a bunch of, a bunch of stuff, Um, a wide variety of things I discuss in my music. Um, Wait, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? No, you're fine. I just wondered if you, you, you were able to use your music to express any aspects of things related to your mental health. And it sounds like, yeah, that you do. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, I definitely like making music has, especially in this pandemic period, now that I'm not in school and don't Mm -hmm. feel as like pressured by music school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Music was really art. That, like going to art school especially music school can be really stressful and I feel like mm-hmm. while I was at NYU well I'm really grateful for it I feel like it was um in some ways really challenging for me to feel comfortable enough to like express myself creatively because there was so much pressure to like build your brand and like figure out your audience and, in like, school oh. really yeah well at least the school that I was like at it's a very it's like it there's a lot of emphasis on like marketing and um and like branding and stuff wow and um, it's a really like interesting program. Uh, yeah. But um, but I felt like while I was there, it was I just felt like there was so much emphasis on like the business aspect of stuff yep. to the point yep. where it got in the way. Like I just found myself thinking more about like needing to make something work or like needing to develop a brand rather than just like sitting down and making music I liked. And so yes. this pandemic I'm really grateful for because I've had so much time and space to really just think about how I want to present mm-hmm. myself creatively. Mm-hmm. When I was at NYU, I was releasing music. Like I had like three songs up on streaming platforms. And when I got home, I made the decision to take everything down and like re like brand myself. Yes. Because Yes. I wanted to, well, I just, one, I felt like I was like impulsively putting out music just because I Mm -hmm. felt like I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. Um, And also I felt like um, now that I'm not in school, I feel like I have more space to kind of just do whatever I want without Mm -hmm. like like the pressure of Mm -hmm. being at school. And especially at Mm -hmm. NYU, because you lived in New York. When you Mm -hmm. are at a school like NYU, you always kind of feel like you're not doing enough Mm because there's people around you that are consistently like, working and grinding and all of this stuff and so um that like level insecurity can definitely really get to you and like really hurt your confidence and stuff 
Um, so, um, I'm kind of going on a tangent. No, time. you're fine. Uh, that wasn't a tangent. You're a hundred percent correct. NYU definitely was a place where I remember when I was there, there was one, I forget her name, but I can see her face like clear. She really reminded me of Tony Braxton. She had the short haircut and everything. And she put on a fashion show and I will never forget. It was like all as black kids. And we were rehearsing for the fashion show. And I remember all I kept thinking was, well, why didn't I come up with something as cool as a fashion show? Like, like, what's wrong with my life that I am not out here being creative? Now, I was getting a master's in counseling. So, you know, the creative part was not my thing. But, and I think she was like in the business school or something. So it really wasn't hers either. But she had this idea. She wanted to bring us together. So she put together this fashion show. So I can completely relate to that. It really is competitive. Not to mention that at a place like NYU, sometimes you're surrounded by people who are coming from, I know when I was there, like these really prominent, like yours, like these really prominent families. And so for them, it's sort of like, I can remember kids talking about their like really fancy vacations in the Hamptons and do you know what I mean? Like going to France and, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm going back to Virginia beach for the break. I'm not going overseas. And so it was all those kinds of pressures, you know? And so I, I definitely can understand that. And it was, you know, even back then, I don't think I had enough knowledge about me to know maybe I need to go talk to somebody to help me manage this extra anxiety that I'm feeling because I think even back then I didn't realize that I was anxious like I don't know if, if you've had this experience but sometimes I think in black families we normalize the experience as if that heightened like all the worrying and like the racing thoughts like yeah. you're not doing enough to overcome it do you know what I mean like yeah. it's not an illness it's like you just need to work a little harder and if you work a little harder yeah. it'll get better no that it's interesting you bring that up because that mentality while I was in school definitely I think was a huge reason as to why it took me so long to start taking medication again because when I, it wasn't until I was out of school and like like I graduated six months ago like I feel separated enough from my time at NYU for me for me to now realize and look back and being like no oh my god I was totally overworking myself <laughs> yes I was totally stressing myself out like I'm 23 I'm so young I have so yes. much time to like yes get my dreams together and like yes be successful I just I look back and I feel bad I wish I could go back and just be like don't stress out so much like you will be fine like you are doing totally fine just like take a deep breath like you will be okay <laughs> Yes. Because that mentality, like it totally is. Like I remember consistently, I was just like wound up and anxious over the fact that I just felt like I wasn't doing enough. Yes. And, and you were in college. Yeah. But you were in college. Like I, and I try to tell like my brother and I have this conversation all the time. Less than 25% of the U.S. population in general has a college degree, right? Yeah. So you're already talking like, a, you know, a tiny, maybe it's 30% now, I don't know, but a tiny portion of the population. So when we're in college, it's almost like if you're a fish and you're in water, that's your natural habitat. So you don't really recognize that you're in water because all the other fish are in water too. You're all swimming. And I think it's sort of like that in college. You're in college and you think that like the hustle and bustle and like I got to do all this stuff and I need to like go get an internship and I need to graduate in so many years yeah. and I got to be on all these committees. We start thinking that that's normal. And it's, it's not. not. It's no, totally not. Like literally, I remember my fall semester of my senior year, I... Um, got an internship, but I didn't get an internship because I wanted to get an internship. I got an internship because I felt like behind that I had an intern <laughs> enough. That's right. Like I already had my internship credit. I didn't need to intern. That's right. So I pushed myself to intern and like just did it because I felt like I had to because That's I felt right. pressured to. And looking back, I'm like, I did not need to put myself through that. Like I did <laughs> not need to like intern three days a week and then yep. like go to class like I was just putting myself into <laughs> way too much stress I was like yep. I don't need to do this to that's right myself. that's you know, right like it's crazy it's really crazy and I definitely feel like New York adds to that because it's such a fast-paced city you know and expensive but, let's not forget expensive because New York so, oh so, girl so I was so broke when I was at NYU it so was just like it was expensive. like my I discovered pork buns at the um in Chinatown, cause they were cheap. Yeah. You know, I could get a pork one for like a like a million years ago. I could get a pork one yeah. for like a dollar. So I was like, I'll do this, and then I can get a couple egg rolls, and that's dinner. Cause I had no money, but I just yeah. like it was so. It's just like you said, it's the school and it's the city, 
and it's the people in this school. So it's like all these things sort of like layer on top of each other and make your things. If you're coming into it already with anxiety, like you shared, you had, and I, I definitely had, then you just, it's just really hard. So what I wonder for you is like looking back on it and knowing like six months ago, congratulations, we're going to celebrate graduation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had my Zoom graduation and I honestly like people are complaining and being sad about the fact that we didn't have an in-person one. Yeah. I loved my Zoom graduation. I woke up and I was in my pajamas. (laughs) I didn't have to change. I was with my family. We ordered (laughs) food, champagne and just like chilled on Zoom. And I was just like, and also it was nice because I got to send the Zoom link to family members that wouldn't have been able to attend. That's right. um, If there was an in-person one. That's right. I had my like aunts and uncles on my dad's and my grandmother attend. <laughs> so nice because so many people got to like witness this big moment. Yes. So I love I it. I was not mad. I was not mad at my Zoom graduation. <laughs> I love my it. My cousin sent me my diploma though. They need to send me that. Yeah, they need to get on it. Come on, Violet. Get, get with that. it. That's right. Get, get this girl her degree. She earned yeah, it. She earned I it. Deserve it. <laughs> so <laughs> so but, tell me, looking back like six months past. How are you centering and taking care of your mental health now? You've talked about medication. What other things do you do to take care of yourself and your mental health? Honestly, one thing that's really been grounding me is like working on um, music because while I was in school, I was like, I spent so much of my energy on making this like one like six song project. And while I remember like from the time from like my junior to senior year, I just stressed myself out so much trying to make this project. And like, I was obsessive about like writing and writing and recording songs. And I remember I found myself so frustrated that I wasn't making the, my, the songs I wanted to make. And like, mm. I was just like hitting a wall creatively regularly. And I was just frustrated that like my music wasn't as good as it could have been and all of the stuff. And, um, and like I said, like, I definitely feel like a lot of that pressure I was definitely putting on myself due to just mm-hmm. the culture of being at NYU and really needing mm-hmm. to just, like, you have your shit together and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But, um, but ever since I've been out of school, I've just have felt just relieved. Like, I know there's a lot of people that have felt very anxious about yeah. graduating, but for yeah. me, it's been just like a breath of fresh air because I feel like I finally just have peace to yes. work on my music at my own pace, however I want to, yes. um, without any outside opinions about anything. So that's been really something that's been bringing me peace is just like being able to, and that's also, like I said, why I took my music off of streaming platforms um, Mm -hmm. back in March, because Mm -hmm. I was like, no, like I released this music when I felt pressured to, when Mm -hmm. I didn't really need to let me take Mm -hmm. this down and give these songs the proper send off Mm -hmm. while I have like space to think about how I want to present myself. So that's really been something that's been grounding me because I feel like I just, have blocked out all the outside noise. Mm-hmm. It's literally just me in the studio apartment and um, nobody else. And, <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, that's been something that's really been grounding me. I've also been binge watching a lot of shows on Netflix. <laughs> Really? Um, lots and lots of shows. Uh, yeah. Do you have a genre? Like my, let me tell you, my genre on Netflix is European crime shows. I'm oh, obsessed. <laughs> they're so bad, but they're like, like not bad as in the quality's bad. Like it's so negative and I really have to take breaks because it gets so heavy sometimes. Like there's yeah. one called Border Town. <laughs> Don't watch it. Like, oh, like you'll have God. nightmares because it is like, it's real creepy. Like not supernatural creepy, just like serial killer type stuff is bad. Um, so that's my, it's very niche is yeah. European crime show. So how about you? Like, what are you watching on Netflix? Oh, a variety of things. Okay. I watched such a widespread amount of things. I just, I recently finished cause I had never seen Avatar, the last airbender, uh-huh. um, but I finished all of that. It's a phenomenal show. I don't know why I didn't watch it while like it was on Nickelodeon, but yeah, it came out on Netflix, and I was like, you know, I've never actually sat down and watched it. So <laughs> right, it was I popular it. too. It's so good. It's yeah, so, it's such an incredible show. So I binged that. I watched um, very different, but I watched Dead to Me with Christina Applegate. Oh my god! See, so even so we're good. best friends now. That show, so good. season it's, one. It's, Blew me away, turns. isn't it? I know. The twists and turns that show go so it's good. Absurd. It, it, it is. It it's is, and it just like threw me for. I think it's um. Was it? Is it James Marsden? Yeah, James Marsden. Who's like amazing just to look at. Let's be honest. Um, but right, but just acting is great too. But I watched that, and like you said, is is so many 
like it's it like just that you just like would not expect and i'm like how much crazier can this show get? just you think it's not gonna and get then it does it gets right. so much crazier You're right 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 it's yeah that show's good that it's show's good yeah, yeah it's amazing so i've watched that um i've recently been re-watching glee <laughs> My daughter would love you. Yeah, she <laughs> loves Glee. Um, I was obsessed with it in middle school, like 12, 13. I was obsessed, obsessed, obsessed. Like my mom got Amber Riley, the person that plays Mercedes, to come to my 13th birthday party to support. Oh, me. you have the best mom in the world. It was, it was my mom is my mom. Well, my mom really pulls through when she pulls through. Good um, mama. I am so thankful for her. But yeah, it was like best 13th birthday party ever. Like, <sighs> I, I don't know where that picture is of me and Amber Riley, but I need to <gasps> ask my mom for it. But it's like me and I'm like 13 and I have like a party. <laughs> oh, how adorable. Oh, you were so in heaven. Cute. You were in heaven, I'm sure. In heaven. But I don't know what inspired me to rewatch Glee, but I've just been rewatching Glee. <laughs> oh, I love it's it. It's a very fascinating show to watch now that I'm older. It's so, yeah. there's so many like more like adult. Um, yeah. The themes, oh yeah, themes and stuff. And yes, like, my mom let me watch this at like twelve. Years and old. the representation, right? What I oh, love yeah, about it was also. just like all. I mean, they like everything was up there, and I that's think it was. Too. Yeah, you know, and so I don't know that I've seen anything with that level and degree and diversity of representation since, except for Shonda Rhimes shows. Like her shows yeah. have a lot of representation too, but just to have it all packed in and it felt, it always felt kind of seamless. Now, I'll be honest, Glee was not my thing, but I would watch it with my daughter sometimes. I just really appreciate it. Like I remember, just, it doesn't matter, but I just remember like pairings, how they would put characters together who were dating. Yeah. I was just like, why didn't we have that when I was a little girl? Like that could have really given me some self-confidence. You know, yeah. if I could have seen like these two people getting together, that would have been just good for my spirit because it wouldn't have felt so odd for a girl like me. Do you know what I mean? To want the things that I wanted in terms of who I wanted yeah. to date. Cool. So that, yeah, I, I love it. Well, that's cool. So that's good. So you've been like uh, Netflix and you just been binging. I love it. Yeah. Binging, binging, binging. What else have I watched? I watched Fleabag. Yep. Um, I haven't seen it, but I heard it. Do you like it? If you liked Dead to Me, you'd like Fleabag. It's okay. like different shows. They're both kind of dark, but in like different ways. But like, it, it's just a really well done, well put together show. I really liked it. I've been watching A Teacher on Hulu. I know what it's, you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, I haven't it's seen really, it. It's, it's intense. It's, it's uh, Mara Rooney is the main, I think that's her name. The teacher. Oh, um, um, the actress. She's, um, she was in, um, oh my God, what's that Kevin Spacey show? Yep. Yeah, I, that's, yep. That's, I know you're talking about. It was oh the God, show where he was the president, when uh, he became president. House, 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 House of, of Cards? House of Cards. Cards? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Kate Mara is her name. That's her name. Kate, Kate Mara. Mara. That's right. Kate Mara, so, yeah. you, so, so you've been enjoying good. that. Yeah. I really like that show. It's oh, I love it. But okay. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good like summary, but a very wide variety. Like I went from like Glee to... <laughs> The oh teacher, right? Teacher. There's like different ends of the spectrum. Right. I love it. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to join me. And it has just been so delightful to talk with you. And would you do me a favor and tell people, if you want to, I know you'll tell us about the books, but where can people follow you? And when you're going to release music, where can they go to learn more about that? And would you tell us the names of the books again? Because I really want to encourage people to go out and get those. Yes. Um, so if you want to follow me, um, all across social, like Twitter and Instagram, my username is Ryan, E-P-R-Y-A-N-E-P-E-E-T-E. -E -E. um, I plan on releasing music sometime spring 2021. And so if you want um, any updates about that, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And that's where I will be posting all of that stuff. Um, and I also have like links and snippets and stuff to my music as well. So if you do want to listen to me sing and hear some stuff, just check out my Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and then my books, um, My Brother Charlie is the first one. And then the second one, Same But Different. And if you look them up, you can literally get them on Amazon. Or just if you look them up online, you can totally find it anywhere at any bookstore. So. Thank you so much, Ryan E.P. You are a delightful human being. Congratulations on your graduation. That's a huge feat. I only wish you like peace and like, because I know what it's like to be anxious. So yeah. I want you to have some peace. I'm going to send like peaceful thoughts your way oh, so you can have you. peace. Oh, of course. And thank you so much for 
everything that you do to advocate. Thank you for being so open um, yeah, about sure. medication and about your journey. Like you say it like it's, oh, it's no big, but it's a huge deal for young people to look and see someone who looks like you, right? Who's incredibly talented, incredib- incredibly articulate, just a beautiful human being. And I think it will mean a lot for them to know um, that there's someone out there like them uh, who has dealt with things related to their mental health and who's actively working on it. So I just, I can't thank you enough. And it's just been such a pleasure to talk with you today. Yeah, totally, totally. Anytime. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So there you have it. That's a wrap for another episode of Couched in Color. We want you to know that we deeply value you, all of our viewers and our listeners, and everyone out there working to support optimal mental health, both for themselves and for our young people. And one of the best ways you can help our movement is by leaving us a five-star review on our YouTube channel and everywhere you enjoy your audio podcasts and by sharing our podcast with a friend. Please also tag us while you're out there listening and watching. Finally, head on over to dralfie.com for more information about me, www.acomaproject.org for information about my nonprofit. And those are the places you can go to learn more about how you can help. So I'll see you next week. And until then, I'm going to say what I always say, which is that I'm wishing you lots of love, lots of light, and that I'm hoping it is always, always informed by good, culturally relevant science. Take care.